Now I will turn it over to one of our colleagues who has been leading the work on the adaptation of the framework and the technical series. Helen Young is a professor and research director at the Feinstein International Center, Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. She will present on behalf of Tufts and FAO. Helen, over to you. Good morning and thank you everyone. Um, as Greg said, I am presenting on behalf of our wider FAO and Tufts University team. As we have heard, there is widespread acknowledgement of the problem of persistent acute malnutrition or wasting, and especially in drylands, and deep concern about the lack of sustainable solutions. This realization, as we've heard, has led to a growing body of professional consensus that there needs to be a radical shift in approach to more sustainable solutions that address the systemic and institutional drivers of acute malnutrition. Now, the proposed, approach, the proposed shift in approach has two aspects. First, a shift in conceptual thinking and understanding of what drives acute malnutrition. And to, to achieve this, we must update and adapt our malnutrition causality framework, looking beyond the immediate and underlying drivers to better understand the basic drivers or root causes of acute malnutrition. Contextualizing these drivers, particularly in dry lands, is necessary if we are to identify sustainable solutions and also practical approaches and ways of working. This shift in conceptual thinking necessitates a shift in operational strategies that emphasize systemic approaches to addressing acute malnutrition. What do we mean by a systemic approach? Essentially, it involves improving the way things work by strengthening those same systems and institutions. We have learned a lot in the past two decades, for example, about the resilience of dry land livelihood systems and how to support them. Yet for most of us, a multi-systemic approach to addressing wasting is still a challenge as it requires exploring new ways of working and learning from different viewpoints. The conceptual shift calls for re-examination, updating and adapting of the malnutrition causality framework for Africa's drylands. There is universal agreement on the immediate and underlying causes of acute malnutrition, and these have changed little since the 1990s and have, we've, as we've heard, have informed responses and technical interventions. But in contrast, the basic drivers of malnutrition have been generally neglected. Now, it's three decades since the malnutrition causality framework was first proposed as part of the UNICEF nutrition strategy for the 90s. And in that time, there have been important paradigm shifts and wide ranging new evidence that must inform our understanding of these basic causes. So with a focus on dryland regions in the Sahel and Horn of Africa, we have drawn from this new body of knowledge and experience in developing the basic drivers of malnutrition. So building on the original framework, the revised framework conceptualizes these basic drivers as three interlinked areas. At the bottom of the screen, we have environment and seasonality, which includes climate variability and extremes, very important in dryland contexts. Next, we have systems and formal and informal institutions. And above that, livelihood systems that include livelihood resources, strategies, and goals. Incorporated into this conceptual framework are the notions of resilience and disaster vulnerability. So let us just consider each of these areas briefly, but also explore how they relate to each other and to the underlying causes of malnutrition. So next slide. Environment and seasonality are underpinned by our understanding of dry land systems as an ecosystem with particular characteristics. And also the new evidence that link these ecosystem dynamics with seasonal patterns of child acute malnutrition. We know that dryland regions are characterized by extreme variability in rainfall and vegetation in both space and over time. So although there are clear seasonal differences in climate, there is wide variability. 
So for example, the start date of the rains, where the rain falls, the duration and intensity of showers, which contributes to unpredictability and variability in the distribution of rangeland resources, such as water and pasture, pasture and is critically important. This has given rise to the idea of what we know as a non-equilibrium environment, where average rainfall is fairly meaningless and where productivity is known to vary widely from year to year and across neighboring locations in the same year, depending on rainfall. Dryland producers are expert in managing this variability and taking advantage of the best conditions that can be found at a particular place and time of year. And these features of drylands and dryland producers managing risk, they are not always well understood by outsiders and therefore not always supported. The FAO and Tufts Mind the Gap research revealed significant relationships between climate, environment and conflict with persistent acute malnutrition and the importance of seasonality to all aspects of people's lives and livelihoods. Tufts undertook a reanalysis of 350 surveys from Sudan, South Sudan, and Chad. And we found two seasonal peaks in acute malnutrition. The first and larger peak at the end of the hot dry season as the rains start, and the second peak coinciding with the end of the rains and beginning of the cool dry season. Work by Tufts colleagues since then has further confirmed this relationship between the climatic variables and multiple seasonal peaks in acute malnutrition using both primary data collection in Chad, which is shown on this uh, figure to the left where you can see the two peaks in 2019 and the colored seasons beneath them as well as a meta-analysis of 20 years of secondary data across all unimodal dryland contexts in Africa. So the next part of our framework relates to systems and institutions. And systems and institutions of relevance to nutrition are obviously wide ranging, including not only food, health, education, but also governance systems, political and economic systems, peace building and conflict prevention, which is crucially important in, in um, in dry land areas affected by conflict, as well as social systems and informal institutions, some of which relate to customs, values, norms and standards. As I said, institutions influence how things work in practice and are critical as they mitigate access to resources. For example, access to land, pastures, water, depend on both formal policies as well as customary tenure regimes, which are rapidly changing as a result of privatization and market forces. So systems and institutions mitigate access to all types of resources, and so in turn they influence vulnerabilities, resilience and inequalities. The picture on the left is from a tribal meeting negotiating cross-border uh, migration of livestock, vitally important to the pastoralists of Sudan and South Sudan. Moving on, livelihood systems. These are predominantly based on the resources or opportunities available. And in dry lands, the extreme environmental variability and seasonality presents both opportunities and risks to livelihoods. Dryland producers take advantage of these opportunities using their specialist skills and knowledge. For example, the seasonal migration of pastoral livestock enables them to graze the most nutritious pastures for the time of year, thereby maximizing productivity. This specialist adaptation is supported by traditional institutions. For example, the dates herds can move to specific grazing areas or when herds might be allowed into farming areas to graze crop residues. However, the resilience of dry land systems has been undermined by multiple processes and institutions, such as regulations that heighten tensions between different producer groups, or privatization of land that restricts access to land by women, or centralized decision-making that fails to take account of local dynamics and priorities. So the question we must ask is which processes and institutions positively affect these dry land opportunities and which exacerbate risks. Furthermore, a livelihoods perspective provides a lens on local priorities and local agency, 
two features that are central to sustainable solutions, yet often ignored by a top-down approach. Furthermore, by incorporating livelihood systems and institutions as part of the causality framework, recognition is given to inequalities in access to all forms of resources, as well as the importance of wider forms of institutional agency and power. So, in exploring how to operationalize a more systemic approach, I would like to highlight some of the key points that were made by our speakers during our series. The starting point for a new approach has to be an understanding of the problem, which is based on an agreed conceptual framework. The Global Action Plan on Wasting has laid the ground for governments to develop their own multi-sectoral nutrition strategy and operational roadmaps. When applied to drylands, this process must incorporate an understanding of the basic drivers of acute malnutrition. Next, as I've said, the unique characteristics of drylands matter. The environmental variability and seasonality of drylands presents opportunities and risks, and these need to be understood. So knowing when wasting is likely to peak and why should be driving the relevant response strategies. Yet, I think we realize most current thinking or much of current thinking only recognizes the lean season peak in wasting while ignoring the earlier larger peak that we have identified. So working with variability is crucial to enhance the resilience of livelihood systems in drylands, which must start with an appreciation of how livelihoods adapt to environmental variability and the implications of this for women and children. In turn, policies and subsequent approaches can support this inherent livelihood resilience while addressing processes that are making producers more vulnerable. Next, while technical fix fixes are obviously necessary, on their own, they are insufficient to address wasting. As we heard during our webinars, a package of technical interventions are not a panacea to vulnerabilities that are socially constructed and the result of power imbalances and inequalities. Alongside technical interventions, we need to strengthen systems and institutions that foster good governance, opportunities and greater equity. And when talking about systemic approaches, we need to ensure this includes a wider range of governance and non-state institutions and systems, such as those traditional institutions I showed you that mediate access to natural resources or social networks or financial systems that allow for the localization of resources. So what is the way forward and where are we along the way? I've talked a lot about clarifying the conceptual framework that is specific to the context of Africa's drylands. And we have tried to make a start on this, building on a body of work by FAO, Tufts and others. The new framework and focus on basic drivers in drylands has generated huge interest and expressions of support. However, there is much more work to be done on the uptake and application of the framework. We needed to develop a strategy for engaging and empowering local stakeholders to lead this, to develop a shared understanding of drivers so as to identify and develop strategies and approaches to address them. Although we have the tools for this, stakeholder analysis, fostering networks, building consensus, combining with capacity development, for many international actors, this will require a shift from directing and determining, say, emergency response strategies to supporting and facilitating consensus building and more participatory approaches. And that is the next point, partnerships and participation. We need to foster strategic partnerships and prioritize, approach, prioritize approaches that include state and non-state institutions and be mindful of informal institutions and their influence on nutrition. Partnerships inevitably involve power imbalances or favor certain capacities over others, the technical over the local knowledge, for example. And an analysis of capacities and power can help to acknowledge the relative strengths and capacities of different partners while acknowledging resource differentials and finding ways to adjust for these. 
And of course, research and learning should underpin new approaches, driven by local processes of prioritization of evidence gaps and favoring interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral approaches. Research and learning provide an excellent basis for collaboration, capacity building, and developing local leadership and ownership of evidence. Over the past decade, mixed methods, participatory approaches, and longitudinal studies have proved particularly fruitful and an essential complement to the gold standard of randomized controlled trials. Through our joint research, publication of the new framework and technical series, we have begun this process of widening and deepening our process of stakeholder engagement, collaborative learning, and consensus building. But while this is early days, it marks a significant step towards a shift in approach, and there is much more work that remains to be done. So we are looking to broaden and deepen the process of stakeholder engagement and are seeking wider commitments to participate in these discussions from stakeholders and a willingness to take this further within their own organizations, including, for example, reviewing where in their ongoing work they have the opportunity to adopt new approaches, such as strategic partnerships or collaboration, explore opportunities for strengthening local institutions as a means to address basic drivers, and review capacities to drive forward a new multi-systemic agenda and support its implementation. We are now poised to take this work forward, but it's together that we will address and improve the nutritional status of children. I look forward to working with all of you as we continue. Thank you.